Okay, welcome. I hope you have a good morning and um, and glad to see you. Any uh, before I start, um, any questions about the, about the quiz or uh, about uh, because by now you should be able to check your grades on NYU classes and if you have any issues. Now, unfortunately, there's not much I can do in terms of partial credit. I know some of you lost points because of a silly mistake, and that's one of the... The only way I can try to reduce this is by increasing the number of questions. So one silly mistake doesn't doom you, but five will. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll work on the next quiz uh, to make it even more user-friendly. But um, any questions before we start, though? So did you send out the, um, the class average or... Are you planning on sending out answers? Yeah. The answers you should be able to check, right? Because all, if you go to NYU classes, it should give you feedback on each question. It should give you the answer to each question. So you should get, so if you check your, um, go to NYU classes, you should be able to get the feedback on the, so you should get the right answer for each question. But I'll see if I can set up the, the average across the, across the class. Thank you. Okay. So today we're going to start in the second packet, and in particular, we're going to move to the second principle in finance. So we spent a lot of time in the investment principle. Today we're going to talk about the financing principle. And when we talk about debt, one of the things we've got to get over is some of us have views on debt that don't come from finance. They come from within. They come from religion. They come from perceptions of debt being a bad thing. In fact, I would argue that every religion probably invades against debt, right? So that, in fact, um, you know, it's a, the, the old proverb, neither a borrower nor a lender be, probably has a religious origin. In fact, um, almost every religion reserves, um, reserves, you know, reserves some penalty for people who borrow money, but an even bigger penalty to people who lend the money. So this notion that debt is a bad thing goes back in time, probably because human beings have always gotten into trouble when they borrow too much money. So I want to set aside that moralistic view about debt, but talk about why it is that companies might want to borrow money and why some companies should not borrow money. So let's, uh, let's review the financing principle. The financing principle says that if you're a business, you want to find first the right mix of debt and equity for you as a company. Remember in your cost of capital, you had a debt ratio and an equity ratio, 10% debt, 90% equity, 30% debt, 70% equity. First thing we want to see is what's the right mix for my company? Keyword is my company. There is no one right mix that applies across companies. We want to find the optimal mix for a company. And we'll go through some tools that will allow us to do it. We also want to answer the question, what kind of debt is the right debt? And let me remind you again what I mean by the right kind of debt. Should I use long-term debt or short-term debt? Dollar debt or euro debt? Floating rate debt or fixed rate debt? Straight debt or convertible debt? The choices proliferate and they're more now than ever before. And you have to decide on the right kind of debt. And the principles are similar, uh, are, are very simple. The right mix of debt for me should be the one that maximizes my value as a company. And second, that right debt for me should match up to the type of assets I have. Remember the example we gave very early in the class about matching debt? We're going to flesh out those principles. So let's start with the choices you face as a business. And this is not just for public companies. And this is why I said early in this class that calling this class corporate finance is, is a bit of a misconception because this is not corporate finance, it's business finance. Every business, small or large, has to make a choice or where to raise money. You're saying, what do you mean where to raise money? There are two ways you can raise money. You can borrow money, we'll call it debt, or you can use your own money, which is equity. So when you think about debt and equity, you often think about balance sheet items, but I want to give you a much more generic definition of debt based upon the differences between the two claims. Here's what debt has that makes it different from equity. The first is you have a contractual claim as a debt holder. What is a contractual claim? You are contractually, you're contractually obliged to get debt payments, interest payments, whereas equity investors might be promised dividends, but there is no contractual commitment. If ExxonMobil tomorrow says, look, we've decided to cut dividends to zero, you can't sue them saying you promised me dividends. Second, usually in much of the world, and this is not always true in every part of the world, payments on debt are tax deductible. Interest expenses are, but payments on equity are not. The third is if you get into financial trouble, 
bankruptcy, for instance, the first claim on the cash flows goes to the lenders, the, the debt, debt holders. The last claim goes to equity investors. Fourth, and this is, I think, a lesser, lesser characteristic because I'm willing to let it go sometimes in debt, and I'll talk about why. Debt usually has a fixed maturity, 10 years, 20 years. Equity is perpetual. And finally, in return for all of these insults, you throw at equity investors. You get no contractual claim. In, you know, you, your last claim on the cash flows, equity investors do get something in return. They get to run the company. They're in control of the company. And lenders usually don't, but you can see that this can sometimes become a gray area if you miss a debt payment, where lenders can take over control. So that's how I think about debt versus equity. And if you think in those terms, every business is debt and equity, right? You start your own business. You know what form your equity takes? It's your savings, perhaps your family savings if they still like you, but your equity takes the form of owner's savings. Your debt usually takes the form of a bank loan. It could even be a credit card extension, right? There are people who start businesses by extending their American Express business cards to $50,000. So very small businesses, equity might be your savings, debt might be credit card debt. As you get a little bigger and you raise equity from other sources, that equity can become venture capital equity and debt can become much more structured bank debt. As you get even bigger and bigger and become public, that equity can go from venture capital equity to public equity, common stock, and debt can become bonds. What I'm trying to say is when I talk about debt and equity in, the, in, the, in these next few sessions, I'm talking about all of those different forms of debt and equity. This is not just about big corporations deciding how much to issue in common shares and how much in bonds. This is about the hot dog stand owner out there deciding how much he should borrow to buy a new stack. This choice is fundamental. Every company has to make it. Now, incidentally, there are hybrids, and we've talked a little bit about those earlier. And what hybrids have are a little bit of the features of both. Convertible debt is part debt, part equity. The bond portion is debt. The conversion option is equity. Preferred stock, at least in the US, has many of the characteristics of debt. It has a fixed dividend, but it's not tax deductible. And you might have a lesser claim on the cash flows. So hybrids fall somewhere in the middle. So those are your choices. Let's lay out some facts before we look at how you make those choices. In this graph, which is a pretty old one, it looks at 84 through 91. I should try to find a study that updates this. We look at how companies have funded themselves in seven, uh, these were the G7 countries. Now, of course, it's G8, but G7 countries, this is how companies funded themselves. So you look at the United, so basically the way to read this is the, the light green is the net debt companies use. The blue is net equity. Those are new equity issues. And the, inter the uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the dark purple is net equity issues. And the blue, the, the uh, this, I don't even know what color blue this is, is internal financing, retained earnings, which is also equity. So look at US companies, the and if you look across the world, a big chunk of the funding for companies comes from net debt. So net debt being debt repay, debt raised minus debt repay. The, in, most of the, in most of the rest of the world, retained earnings actually matches or exceeds net debt as a way of funding. And net equity is a part of the funding in every country except the US where it's negative. You say, how can net equity be negative? Well, if you buy back more stock than you issue, net equity can be negative. And for the US, net equity has been negative for a long time. We'll see how this plays out in debt ratios and debt to EBITDA multiples. But this is just a big picture perspective of where companies raise their money. Before I keep bulldozing on, any questions about what I've brought out so far in terms of the difference between debt and equity and at least the broad patterns of financing across the world? Yes. Does the internal financing only include the retained earnings? Yes. Or also includes like the virtual shares to employees? Well, shares to employees, uh, that's an interesting question. Shares to employees are just expense. They don't go back into the company, right? So if you think about shares to employees as, so compensation expense is not counted as a financing. It's counted as an expense. So when you give shares to employees, it's to pay them. It's not. It, it's not. It's not a way of financing the company. Like for employees who pay for that, need to pay for it to buy the stocks. I, well, why would do you? What do you mean pay for it? Uh, so why why would this? Why would they given the shares at a discount? 
And if they pay for them, then I would count that as part of a, a part of part of net equity. Because when it's net equity, it doesn't matter whether it's internal people or outside people paying for it. So that would be in the net equity component. In much in the U.S., for instance, when when employees get equity, they don't pay for them. They either get restricted shares as part of their compensation packages or options. So if employees are required to pay for shares, then I would treat it as part of net equity. Okay, so let's move on. And if you look at the way companies raise debt, and this table also needs to be updated, at least in, until about 20 years ago, in the US, you could see a much bigger dependence on bonds and a much less dependence on bank debt. But in the rest of the world, bank debt dominated. In fact, if you'd done this graph for emerging markets in the 1990s, 100% of the debt in emerging markets came from banks. So I'm gonna ask you a question. You're a company and you want to raise debt and you have two choices. You can issue bank loans or go to a bank and, and take a loan or you can issue corporate bonds. Is there a way you could decide which one is better for you? Or what will determine which choice is better for you? Why do some companies borrow money from banks and what? If you have a choice, why do companies borrow money from banks as opposed to issuing corporate bonds or vice versa? Rizwana says interest rate. That would be too obvious, right? So you're saying whichever one gives you the lower interest rate. No, okay, maybe bank. So which one do you think gives the lower interest rate? Bank loans or uh, corporate bonds? And what might drive that lower interest rate? I guess it depends on the company's ratings and what the, and what it is raising that rate. Let me, okay, so let's say your company has a double B rating, right? It tries to issue bonds. It's going to have to pay a high rate, right? Now it goes to the bank. Why would the bank lend to it at a lower rate? Maybe because the project that it is raising for is less risky than Okay, the now we're on to something. And how does the bank know the project is less risky? Because a company can give proprietary information to a bank that it cannot give to the market. So one reason companies might use bank loans as opposed to corporate debt or corporate bonds is with the bank you can actually provide information that is proprietary and not worry about it getting into your competitors. So there are some people who think corporate bond rates will always be lower than bank loan rates. That corporate bonds dominate? That's not true. There are some companies where the bank loan rate can be lower than the corporate bond rate because bank loans can, you can provide information. Go ahead. Mohit. Mo I can't, what, Mohit, are you talking to me or are you talking to somebody on the side there? Okay, so I, so the other point that was raised is you can secure the bank debt with your, with your, that is true, but that's a fake lower interest rate. If you're doing that, then the rest of your debt is to get riskier. But what I'm saying is you have a choice. And at least in the US, larger companies have this choice. And for much of the world until about 20 years ago, including Europe, there was no choice. You had to go to the bank. And that's bad. When the only way of raising debt is through bank loans, you're at the tyranny of the bank. The bank can say only three-year debt and you're stuck with three-year debt. One of the things that's happened in the last 20 years is the access to corporate bonds has increased and the percentage of debt that is coming from corporate bonds is now much greater than it was before in every part of the world. If you go to my website, I actually break down debt by corporate bonds versus bank loans, and you can see the proportions have risen across the world, even in emerging markets. So the choice between bank debt and corporate bonds is not that straightforward. It requires assessing, you know, which one will give you the lower rate, but that lower rate can come from you being able to give information to the bank that you could not have given on a corporate bond. Any other, any questions about corporate bonds versus bank loans before we move on? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take four of my six companies and tell you how they borrowed money. These are my four public companies. I'm not going to try this for Deutsche Bank. You know why? Because as I mentioned for banks, debt is not a source of capital. It's really raw material. So talking about the debt for a bank is kind of, you know, you get, it's like nailing gel to a wall. It's impossible to get it nailed down. So I took Disney, Vale, Tata Motors and Baidu and looked at their debt right now, as in 2013. Let's start with Disney. Disney had $14.3 billion in book value of debt. And I remember how I computed the market value of that debt using the current market interest rate, 13 billion in market value debt. So that's interest bearing debt. 
And in 2013, remember, accountants were not treating leases as debt. I had to do that myself. And that debt was $2.9 billion. If you're doing this for Disney in 2019, that lease debt might already be on the balance sheet. So Disney has about $13 billion in interest-bearing debt, $2 billion in lease debt. That proportion is not uncommon for, for, for a company like Disney. If I did this for Walmart, though, the bulk of the debt will be lease debt, less will be interest-bearing debt. So that proportion is going to be driven by what business you're in. If you look at Vale, $41 billion of the debt is interest-bearing debt, $1.3 billion is lease debt. Again, Vale doesn't have much in leases. Tata Motors either doesn't have any lease debt or they're not revealing the lease debt in commitments. I couldn't find it in their footnotes in 2013. And Baidu has about 15 billion in interest-bearing debt, 15 billion yuan in interest-bearing debt, and about 3 billion in lease debt. I then looked at what type of debt each company had. Disney had about 8% bank debt, 92% corporate bonds. The bulk of their debt took the form of corporate bonds. And that's not going to be unusual when you look at very large US companies. They will have some bank debt, but the bulk of their debt will be corporate bonds. Vale had about 60% bank debt, 40% corporate bonds. And that is very different than Vale had, what Vale would have had in the 1990s. In the 1990s, all of Vale's debt would have been bank debt. Even Tata Motors is 38% bank debt. The 38% corporate bonds, 62% bank debt. The bulk of their corporate bonds they issued through Jaguar Land Rover in Europe and the US. Baidu is 100% bank debt. So the structure of debt varies across the companies. I also looked at the maturity of the debt. For Disney, about 13% of the debt is less than a year in maturity. It has the highest percentage of short-term debt, but it also has the highest percentage of really, really long-term debt, more than 20 years. We pause for a moment. Remember we said about matching debt to your assets? Now, where do you think Disney needs this really, really long-term debt? Which part of Disney's business do you think might need that long-term debt? I would think the infrastructure investment, the theme parks, the cruise ship, thank God help you on that debt. No? It'll be their longest term assets. Okay? So when you look at Disney, they have, it's almost like a barbell, really short term debt, really long term debt, that they have a lot of debt between one to five years, which makes sense, right? If you look at the bulk of their other businesses, they're much more short term. If you look at Vale, Vale is the highest percentage of really, really long term debt, 38%. Well, which makes sense. Iron ore mines last 30, 40, 50 years. They have relatively little short-term debt, about 6%. Tata Motors is even less short-term debt. A lot of their debt is bunched up between 1 to 10 years, about 88% of their debt. And if you look at Baidu, they have about 90% of the debt being below 10 years, which in a sense makes sense again, right? You look at Baidu, most of their projects, if you're a technology company, you don't take 35-year projects. So again, at least at the very mild level, the maturity seemed to make sense. Then I looked at what currency the debt was in. For Disney, 95% of the debt was in US dollars, 5% was in foreign currency. Now, what would I compare this to to get a sense of whether it makes sense? I mean, 95% of the debt is dollar debt, 5% is foreign currency. What could I look at in Disney that would tell me, hey, does this make sense? I could look at what currency the revenues are, right? I don't know whether you remember, but when we did, when we did the equity risk premium for Disney, I looked at what percentage of Disney's revenues came from outside the US, and it was 18%. I know this is a very preliminary assessment, but if you get 18% of your revenues outside the US and only 5% of your debt is foreign currency debt, my preliminary assessment is you probably have too little foreign currency debt. I'd have to know what currencies that, that debt is, that, that revenue is in to make a precise judgment. But it looks like, at least from a preliminary assessment, that Disney has too little foreign currency debt. Let's move to Vale. About 35% of their debt is in real, 65% in foreign currency, primarily dollars. Does that make sense? Or what would I do there? Probably the same thing I did for Disney. Look at where their revenues come from. And if you remember, what was Vale's biggest market? As an iron ore mining... China, China. It was China, 37%. China China, China is always the answer. They get their revenues in a commodity market. In fact, I'm surprised 
that they have even 35% of their revenues in rias. You know, it might, because it makes, it, all their revenues are probably in dollars. My guess is they should be even more dollar based than they actually are. Tata Motors is about 71% rupee debt, 29% foreign currency debt. And there again, it makes sense, right? What's a foreign currency debt, Ed, do you think? What part of Tata Motors? It's going to be Jaguar Land Rover, basically. Then it could be China. Thank you, Shishanka. It's China because Jaguar Land Rover's biggest market is probably China. But Jaguar Land Rover. And finally, you look at Baidu, and here I have a puzzle. What's Baidu's business? It's a search engine, right? Where's the search engine used? Here, China is definitely the answer. I have never talked to anybody who's used Baidu who's not from China. But look at the breakdown of debt. 82% of their debt is foreign currency debt. 18% is in, is in local currency. That makes no sense to me. Unless their revenues are all coming in foreign currencies, which they're not. So that is a puzzle. We'll have to come back and grapple with it later when we look at the type of debt. But that was my stop when I looked at debt. And you know, on your project, you can do this very simply, right? Look at what percent of the debt is foreign currency debt and compare it to how much of their revenues are in foreign currencies. And finally, I looked at how much of the debt was fixed rate debt, where the coupon rate is set up front, and how much is floating rate debt, where the rate gets reset every year based upon a T-bond rate. It used to be LIBOR, but LIBOR's fallen out of favor, but fixed or floating rate debt. And if you look across my companies, two of my companies, Vale and Tata Motors, the debt is almost entirely, it's, no, it is entirely fixed rate debt. Disney and Baidu have about 5% floating rate debt. We'll come back and ask, is that enough floating rate debt? Should they use more? But at least you're getting a picture of where these companies stand right now. Any questions before we move into looking at the trade-off between debt and equity? Now, Rodrigo asked the question, is it possible that Baidu is so much debt because it's cheaper than the... Cheaper in what sense, Rodrigo? Let's let's go down this rabbit hole. But when you say cheaper, what are you talking about? That the interest rate on the euro debt is lower than the interest rate on the renminbi or yuan debt? Is it? I hope that's not what you mean by cheaper. No, no. <laughs> it if it's cheaper, it has to be not. It has you have to correct for current currencies. That banks overseas are actually willing to lend to you at a lower rate than banks, domestic banks. That's unusual, but it could happen. Maybe that's the explanation. Is European banks have, have so much glamour attached to being in China, at least then, that they were willing to lend to a Chinese company. Maybe that's a, a, the explanation. We'll come back, as I said, and take a deeper look at this debt. But it's very difficult to explain from a corporate finance perspective that mismatch. Okay. Um, I was also going to ask, in, in terms of in terms of cheapness, you, you hear about these corporations and foreign company countries that use the U.S. debt capital markets to issue in U.S. currency, and then engage in a swap to, yeah. to the currency that they actually want to hold. Yeah, um, just and the nature of how deep the market is. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? That makes sense because if you have a fairly illiquid debt market, let's say you're in a country where the only debt is bank debt, or you have a corporate bond market that's very illiquid. One of the things you might be able to do is go to the U.S., issue corporate bonds in U.S. dollars. you got a mismatch, but then you get rid of that mismatch using forwards or futures. And you can end up with local currency that, that's lower than what you could have borrowed at the bank. I'm, okay, I'm perfectly okay with that. That's not a mismatch because after you've done the hedging, it's back to being matched up. But I would check. I wouldn't take them at their word. I would take the forward because it costs you to do the hedging. I would look to see what their adjusted rupee or rupiah rate is on their debt and compare it to what they can borrow money at. Because managers sometimes use this rationale and then they go do stupid things. But I think it's a perfectly appropriate rationale if you can back it up. And earlier you mentioned the point, another difference between bank loans and corporate, um, bank loans and corporate bonds, which I, I'm glad you raised was bank loans are much more rigid. So for instance, 
bank loans as are all, you you might have a balloon payment loan and that's all you can do or you can't have these special features in bank loans for the payments you know so bank loan might be structured in a way where you can't really mess with the structure corporate bonds are much more flexible in repayment schedules and how you structure them as we'll see when we get to the matching debt stage it's much easier to design a corporate bond that matches your needs than to get a bank to agree to structuring a bank loan around those needs. Ben? Yeah, my guess on Baidu would be something about the Chinese government um, wanting them to raise more money in foreign currencies for foreign investment. I don't really know why that would be, but I just know that. That's, that's more for e it's yeah, it's more for equity than than debt, I would think. I don't think the Chinese government wants Chinese companies to be indebted to foreign banks. I don't think that's in, that's something they think of as a good thing. But with equity, they clearly want you to get foreign institutional investors, which is one reason they look the other way when Alibaba and Baidu both listed on the NASDAQ, right? I mean, these are quintessential Chinese companies, but the listing happened in a global market because you could attract more foreign institutional investors. Now, Rizwan asked whether you prefer floating or fixed rate. Can I hold off on that discussion? Because we're going to come back and ask when is floating rate better? Because for some companies, floating rate debt is better. For others, fixed rate. And we're going to talk about what kinds of companies. Okay. So now, now let's talk about picking the right debt ratio for your company. I'm going to give you a very simplistic way of thinking about what the right debt ratio for your company is. Now, one of my favorite structures, which you will see over and over again as we go through this class, is a corporate life cycle. I put it up, I think, in the very first session, I put, that, put up this life cycle, where I talked about how companies are born, startups, then they're toddlers, think of it as young growth, and they become teenagers, think Tesla. You know, every day they wake up and say, what can I do today to screw it all up? Then they have high growth, peak of your life, then you get middle age, mature growth. And then you get past middle age, let's call that mature stable, and then you get old, and then you die. Very morbid thought, but think of companies as going through the life cycle. I'm going to take companies at each stage in the life cycle and talk about how they should fund themselves. If you're a startup, you sh your cash flows are non-existent, right? You have no earnings, you have negative cash flows. You know what you should fund yourself with? If you can, it should be all equity. It could be your savings, it could be venture capital. A startup that borrows money is begging to go to, into bankruptcy. It doesn't make any sense. Young growth, same thing. You should be entirely or completely focused on equity because you get none of the tax benefits of debt. And adding debt just puts your future at risk and everything is in the future. High growth, still very heavily dependent on equity. As you get to maturity, as you get a mature company and your earnings start to rise and your reinvestment needs start to drop off and your cash flows get more predictable, you should start to borrow money. Debt capacity opens up. In middle age, you're in the peak of debt capacity. You should borrow more money. And then when you go into decline, your debt ratio might stay constant, but the amount of debt you have should decline as your company declines. So I would expect your funding to reflect where you're in the life cycle. One of my favorite games to play is to pick a company that I've never heard of, you know, read about the company, put it in the life cycle, and without looking at the balance sheet, guess how much debt it should have on the balance sheet. So let me throw a company at you, Casper. You might have never looked at the balance sheet, but given where, you know, Casper went public just a few months ago, mattress company, how much debt should you see on the balance sheet for Casper? Nothing, very little. In fact, many of you are working with companies where you see very little debt. And many of you are working with companies which are high growth companies. Why? Because that's where the excitement lies. So when you have young firms that borrow money and borrow money because they want, don't want to give up control, I think of it as insane. I think young firms that go out and raise debt because they don't want to give up ownership are trading off being healthy growing companies for you know they're giving up on that because they so value control and they want to drive their company to the ground it makes absolutely no sense but rob's rob raises the question the point which is true which is in some companies the entrepreneur is so wary about giving up control that they'd rather borrow money and put the company at risk than give up some control there's no choice. If you really want your young company to become an older company, you have to give up control. You have to raise equity. And even those 
VCs who claim to lend money to private companies, you look at it, it, it's called convertible debt. It's really all conversion often with a little bit of debt. You know why they add the debt? Because it gives them more contractual power. So any questions about the life cycle perspective? It's a very interesting and powerful perspective that you can bring to play when you look at a company. And you look at a company and say, why does this company have so little debt? Maybe just put in the life cycle. Most of the time, it'll explain to you why the company has the debt that it does. And when you get a mismatch, you should be really nervous. You know what I mean by a mismatch? A young company with a lot of debt or a mature company with very little debt. You should say, what's going on here? Any questions? So every company, as it moves through the life cycle, will hit transitions. And when you hit that transition, you have to change the way you fund yourself. So let's say you start a business. Initially, it's all your savings and you use just your savings. And then you get to a point where you realize you've run out of savings. Your family doesn't want to talk to you anymore because you've tapped them out. That's a transition from owner savings to venture capital. And you know what the venture capital demands in return? A pound of your flesh. So be ready to give up probably a disproportionate share of your ownership to that venture capitalist because they're the only game in town. Then you keep growing and you succeed more. Then you go public. Now you've hit the public equity market. So then you keep going. You become a mature company. Then you can use corporate bonds. So there are transitions in every company. It happens and sometimes the companies don't notice it. But this is the process by which companies move through the life cycle. Okay? So let's now talk about the right debt ratio for your company. Now, when you talk about debt ratios, you want to look at the mix of debt and equity you have as a company. You're looking at debt as a percentage of capital. Now, of course, the question then becomes, how do you measure debt and equity? There are two ways you can do it. One is you can trust the accountants and go with book value. And if you decide to go with book value, you have to decide what to include in debt. And with, my, with equity, with book, book value, that book value could very well be a negative number for some companies. Here's what I'm going to suggest. I'm going to suggest that if you're going to talk about the right debt ratio for your company, you should always talk in market value terms. You're going, to, you're going to say, well, what about private companies? We'll come back and talk about private companies. But even with private companies, book values are meaningless. So when I talk about debt and equity from this point on, for the rest of this capital structure section, I'm talking about market values. And my definition of debt, you should already be familiar with. It includes all interest-bearing debt, and all lease commitments and all contractual commitments in market value terms. So I'm talking about market value debt ratios and a measure of debt that includes all interest bearing debt and lease commitments. So with that structure in mind, let's look at two questions that every, que every company has to answer. One is, you know, what's the right mix of debt and equity for my company? And the second is, what's the right kind of debt for my company? So let's look at that first question. If I'm going to go out and raise funding for my company, what is the trade-off between debt and equity? Why should I use one over the other? And I'm going to start by laying, at least in very qualitative terms, that trade-off. And these qualitative terms are very, very useful in explaining why companies, some companies borrow more money than others, and why companies in some countries might borrow more money than companies in other countries. So let's start by looking at the trade-off. Let's start by listing out what I call the illusory benefits. There are lots of companies out there that go out and borrow money. If you ask them why they borrow money, they give you reasons that really make no sense, but they, 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 they use them because they look at the surface like they make sense. It's an illusion because it doesn't really exist. I'll give you one of the most common illusions. Companies claim they borrow money because debt is cheaper than equity. And technically it is, right? It, the cost of debt should be lower than the cost of equity. There's a simple reason for it. Why should the cost of debt, even without the tax benefits, why should the cost of debt be lower than the cost of equity? Because of the contractual obligations to pay interest. Yeah, as Rami pointed out, you know, if you're the debt holder, you get first claim on the cash flows. What's the equity investor? He's always the last guy in line. So if the debt holder says, I want 10%, you know what the equity investor says? I want 15%. So the cost of debt is always going to be lower than the cost of equity. And that's your rationale for borrowing. God help you. Your company is going to be 99.9% .9 debt. But when you borrow money at what you think is a lower rate, you know what you're doing to your equity? You're making your equity riskier. The risk in a business comes from the investments you take. So let's suppose you take an investment with 100 units of risk. 
that 100 units of risk stays there whether you use all equity or 50% or debt. But here's what happens. As you borrow money, the equity investors see the debt piling up in their corner. That's why we do levered betas. If you wondered about the intuition behind levered betas, that's exactly what we're doing. Is as you borrow money, I'm loading up the risk on your equity investors. And in a world with no tax benefits, and you don't have to believe me for the moment, in a world without any tax benefits, when you borrow money at a lower rate, you're actually pushing up your cost of equity by enough to kind of overcome whatever benefits you thought you had. So when people talk about the benefits of debt, they sometimes use very strange rationale. Debt is cheaper than equity. No, it's not. Debt will push up my return equity. Yes, it will, but your cost of equity is also going up. So the notion that you can borrow money just because it'll make your return in equity go up or because it's cheaper than debt is illusory. So let's talk about the real costs and the real benefits of debt. Let's start with the real benefits. There are two benefits to debt and they are fun, and, and one is a big one and one is a secondary one. The big benefit of debt is a tax benefit. You know what drives us to borrow money? The tax code. And the tax benefit of debt rises from the fact that interest expenses are tax deductible. Cash flows to equity have to come out of after tax cash flows. You know what I mean by that, right? Dividends have to be paid out of net income, which is after tax income. Interest expenses are tax deductible. So we're going to start with the tax benefit of debt. And we're going to draw some interesting implications about what kinds of companies should borrow money. The second benefit I'm going to talk about for debt is in some companies, and it's a subset of companies, managers can get undisciplined about the way they pick projects. You know what I mean by undisciplined? They're using other people's money. They're using shareholders' money. They take bad projects and they say, I don't care. In those companies, making those companies borrow money can make managers a little more disciplined in the way they pick projects. So I'm going to talk about that. It's a subtle argument. He's saying, how can borrowing money make me more disciplined? We'll, we'll see what kinds of companies that might apply. Those are the two big benefits. That has to be offset against three costs. The first is a bankruptcy cost. When you borrow money, whether you like it or not, you've increased your chances of getting into trouble. You're saying, what if I'm a really big company with lots of cash flows? What if I'm Apple? Even for Apple, borrowing an extra $10 billion will increase the probability of getting into trouble, maybe from 0.01% to 0.03%, but borrowing money always increases your chances of distress. So there's a bankruptcy cost, and we've got to bring that into the equation. The more money you borrow, the higher that bankruptcy cost. The second is an agency cost. You're saying, what's an agency cost? An agency cost arises when you have two groups of people with very different interests. And when you borrow money, you create that agency cost. And here's why. What do equity investors want? They want upside. What do bankers and lenders want? They want no downside. So bankers and lenders ran a company, they would never take projects. They would just keep the cash and pay themselves. So whenever you borrow money, you create an agency cost. And we're going to see that that agency cost translates to a higher cost for equity investors to bear when they borrow the money. You're saying, why should equity investors bear it? Because they're the ones who run the company and borrow the money. And the third cost is when you borrow money, you give up that, that, that rainy day buffer you bought. You know how many companies today after this crisis are wishing they hadn't borrowed money a year ago, two years ago. It's too late now. But those companies that held back on borrowing money are feeling pretty good right now. So tax benefits and added discipline, bankruptcy costs, agency costs, and loss of flexibility. I'm going to take each of these and spend some time on them because understanding these is central to understanding why companies should borrow money and why some companies should not borrow money. So the fundamental premise for the tax benefit of debt comes from the fact that interest is tax deductible. This is true over much of the world. In fact, the only part of the world where this is not true is the Middle East. In, in the Middle East, of course, interest is not tax, but every other part of the world, it's true. It, there are restrictions in some parts of the world on how much interest expense you can have, but there is, there is still that tilt in the tax code. And the benefit from debt is actually a very simple one. If you have $100 million in interest expenses and you have a 25% tax rate, and that's your marginal tax rate. That's one of the things about the tax benefit of debt is it happens at the margin. You're saving about $25 million in taxes. So think about it. Your tax benefits from debt are directly proportional to how high your marginal tax rate is. So let's make our first proposition. The higher the marginal tax rate for a company, the more debt it should have 
holding all else constant. Everybody uh, agree with that premise? The higher the marginal tax rate, the more debt you should have. Okay? Think about the implications that come out of that. If you look across the world, marginal tax rates vary across countries. Let's take Europe. What's a country in Europe with the lowest marginal tax rate? In the EU, let's take the EU. What's it, what's Ireland? Ireland with about a 12% tax rate. Some of the Eastern European countries are trying to compete with Ireland. So let's take airlines in Europe. They're all in bankruptcy now, but let's say in healthier times, looked at airlines across Europe. You looked at Ryanair, you looked at an EasyJet, which is UK based, you looked at Lufthansa. I mean, basically you go around and you look at all the airlines. Which airline would you expect to have the least debt? Just take this proposition, Gary. For I'm sorry? Emirates. Emirates, of course. Yeah, between, in, I asked about the EU, but that's a good point. Emirates is going to have no debt because in the Middle East, the tax rate is zero. But within Europe, given that you have different marginal tax rates, you should expect Ryanair to have a lot less debt than Lufthansa, right? So when you look at marginal tax rates across countries, you're already getting a snapshot of what country should have the most debt. Prior to 2018, you know what the marginal tax rate in the U.S. was? I'm going to mention it in class. It was the, the federal corporate tax rate was 35. By the time state and local taxes got added, it was 40 percent of the highest marginal tax rate in the world for corporates. Highest marginal tax rate. And guess what? U.S. companies borrowed based on that 40% tax rate. What the 2017 tax code did was it lowered the tax rate. We're going to come back and talk about what effect it's had on the debt. It lowered the marginal tax rate to 25%. If you think about that change, that's monumental. You've reduced the tax benefit of debt by almost 40%. Because that is by far the biggest benefit to borrow money. Already you can see why money losing companies or companies with big net operating losses shouldn't borrow money. What's the marginal tax rate for a company which is carrying $20 billion in NOLs forward? It's going to be 0% at least for the near future. Why would you borrow money now if your marginal tax rate is 0%? Wait until you have a capacity to claim that. That's why it didn't make any sense to me when Tesla went out and borrowed $5 billion three years ago. I wrote an entire blog post venting about this. I said, this makes no sense. I like the company. I like the fact that it has potential. Why would you want to put that all at risk? So use the tax benefit argument. It's an incredibly powerful one. But I want to take one subset of business and focus in on this marginal tax rate issue. The real estate business in the U.S., there are two ways you can structure a publicly traded real estate business in the U.S. One is as a real estate corporation where you're treated like any other company and you have taxes and you pay interest as tax deductible, or you can create what are called real estate investment trusts, REITs. What makes REITs different from real estate corporations is first, they're required to pay out 95% of their earnings as dividends. You're saying, this is terrible. But in return for that, they don't have to pay taxes at the entity level, which means their taxable income flows through directly into net income. So in effect, their marginal tax rate is 0%. So you have real estate companies, you got REITs. Given what we just said, which group should have the higher tax rate? This is an easy one. Real estate corp should have a much higher tax rate. In fact, I'm always puzzled by how much debt REITs sometimes carry. And REITs sometimes, I think, carry debt as, as almost as a, as a bridge debt to kind of until they raise equity. You know, the other group of companies which I don't think should ever borrow money, but do like they do like crazy. What's the other group of companies? They're right now in the spotlight. In fact, they're being talked about in the bailout bills that pays almost no corporate taxes. Yeah. Cruise lines, exactly. Take a look at almost every cruise line. You know where they're incorporated? In Panama, Liberia. How many Liberians do you think go on cruises? I don't mean that as an insult to Liberia, but no, I don't think millions and millions of Liberians get on cruise ships to Antarctica. Cruise liners pay no corporate taxes. That's why it makes it so 
ironic that they're looking for bailouts because you've structured your company to pay no taxes. You've got the debt. It, it, it's it's interest expenses. You know, it's um that 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 are that that the tax benefits are not there. Why would they borrow money? Because cruise ships cost a lot. But that's a terrible reason to borrow money. If I were creating a cruise line company, I wouldn't do that. I don't like the business, but if I were, I would try to fund those, those ships with a lot more equity. You think that'll be a lot more shares, but guess what? I'd be far less likely to go under every three or four or five years. Cruise ship companies have borrowed money with none of the tax benefits and huge bankruptcy costs. And what they're hoping for, I guess, is a bailout every time they get into distress, but they don't deserve it. They've played the debt game to get no, to claim the, 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 the interest expenses, but they're not getting any of the bankruptcy costs that go with it if they're bailed out. So keep that in mind when you look at debt. So now let me focus on what happened at the end of 2017. At the end of 2017, you had a Corporate Tax Reform Act. Now, one thing to remember, when you have corporate tax reform in the U.S., it is a monstrosity. It's 1,200 pages with clauses that nobody reads. Things cre crept in there. But the biggest change it made to corporations was the marginal tax rate for companies was dropped to about 21% at the federal level, and if you include state and local taxes, 25%. Now, I've kind of answered the first question. The effective tax rates in 2017 for the US was about closer to 20, 20 I think it was 20, let me pull up the number, I can't see it. Uh, it was about 22%. So in 2017, even before the Tax Reform Act, the effective tax rate was 22%. The marginal tax rate was 40%. I gave away the answer, but I want somebody to flesh out why this is so. Why am I not using talking about the 22% and I'm talking about the tax benefit of debt? Why do I keep talking about the 40%? What is the explanation for why the marginal tax rate is the tax rate that drives the tax benefit of debt? Go ahead, Sanjana. Or... Whoever wants to go first, go ahead. Yeah, I can go on. So basically, the tax deduction you get is from the last piece of earning, which um, that would fall on the marginal tax rate. And, and, and I'll give you and I'll give you a kind of example to illustrate how this played out. Prior to, between 2013 and 2017, Apple borrowed about eighty billion dollars. Sounds like a lot, but remember, they're a trillion dollar company. Eighty billion dollars. You know where all of that debt, I mean, Apple's effective tax rate was about 16%. Why? Because not because they were deferring taxes, but because they didn't come in other parts of the world, which were being taxed at lower rates. But you know where they placed all of their debt? Where was the 80 billion borrowed? What part of the world? Where did I say you had the highest marginal tax rate? The US exactly. This is the thing that people miss when they talk about debt. They act like companies are kind of forced to borrow money in whatever parts of the world they operate in. They can borrow money in the highest tax rate. And remember earlier we talked about how you can use forwards and futures and options to get rid of the currency mismatch. They don't have the currency mismatch. They get the best of both worlds. That's what made the U.S. tax code so perverse prior to 2017. It was collecting about the same amount in taxes as the European tax codes were, but the marginal tax rate was set much higher, which meant that U.S. companies were getting a much bigger tax benefit from debt. So in a lot of the 2017 tax code, people don't like, especially if you live in a high tax rate state like I do, California, New York, New Jersey. But one of the things that I think that the tax code did, which was good, it brought the marginal tax rate down for the US from 36 to 21 percent the federal level but even with state and local taxes down to about 25 percent. So holding all else constant what should we expect to see happen to debt and debt ratios at US companies in 2018 and 2019? They should fall right? I expected them to go down and in fact I've been tracking it and I've looked at 2018 so if you think about 2018 you no, know, you'd expect the debt to be much lower but maybe you give them a one-year adjustment by 2019 you should expect to see much lower debt I'm going to come back and show you a graph as to what's happened to debt in 2019 it's actually it not exploded I'm sorry because what? people are, it would have exploded because people are looking at FCHF going higher 
that's not a good re- I mean, FCFF going higher is not a good reason to borrow money. So why would you go I'm out and... I'm not saying it's a good reason. I'm yeah. saying it is the reason why people are thinking. I think there's an even true. even more intuitive reason. What's happened to interest rates over the last 12 years? You know the other I- illusory reason for debt? Interest rates are low, you should borrow money. You know why that reason doesn't make sense? When interest rates are low, what happens to your cost of equity as well? Goes down. Goes down. The reasoning that you should borrow more money when interest rates are low is an ill thought through reason because it acts like the cost of equity stays fixed and just the cost of debt falls. Interest rates are like a tide. If they go up, both the cost of debt and cost of equity go up. So there are bad reasons why this might have happened. But for whatever reason, 2018 and 2019, you didn't see a big drop off in debt. There was a slight decline in debt as a multiple of EBITDA. But that's reaching for straws. Now, I'll give you my reasons. You know, I think that companies borrow money not for good reasons, but for two reasons in corporate finance that I think explain a lot of what companies do. One is inertia. You know what inertia is, right? You do the things you've always done. So it's almost like a guy goes to the bank every year, borrows $5 billion, and they forget to tell him to stop. He keeps going to the bank, borrowing $5 billion every year because that's what you've always done. The other is peer group. If everybody else in your sector is borrowing money, guess what you do? You borrow money too. It's insane, but it's exactly how companies structure much of corporate finance. So for better or worse, you'd expect debt to have come down, but it hasn't. This crisis might be what triggers companies re-examining that debt. Because as we said, the crises remind you of the bad side of debt. I mean, debt is a two-edged sword. And often you see the good edge, and now you're seeing the, seeing the bad edge. Maybe that'll bring companies back to it. Let's talk about the second argument for borrowing money. Basically, let me set the stage. Remember in corporate governance, we talked about how some companies, managers control the company and shareholders have very little power. Let's suppose you have a company like that. It's a, it's a mature company, lots of cash flows coming in. Managers basically run the company. They run it for their best interest. Now remember, it's much more comfortable being a manager of an all equity funded company because there is no contractual obligation. So you're the manager of an all equity funded mature company. You basically run the company, right? You run it for your best interest. You're, you, I, I, would, I would assume you'd have a ten, tendency to get sloppy. You know what I mean by sloppy? You look at a project, it's a bad project, you take it anyway. You say, who cares? I have the cash flows to cover it up. You use the health of the company, the cash flows, to cover up bad mistakes. Forcing that com- this, you know, company like this to borrow money might actually bring some discipline into the process. And here's why. When you borrow the money, you now have interest payments to make. You take that same bad project, you might run into trouble. Essentially, I'm trying to make this matter to you as a manager. I call this the Volvo argument for debt. Let me explain why I call it the Volvo argument for debt. Let's assume that you've graduated, you've gone to work for a consulting firm or an investment bank, you know, you're making a lot of money, you move to the suburbs, you buy a big house. So the two cars, two, you know, two car garage, two cars in the garage, two wives, two, whatever makes you happy. And every day you go into work and you, you're a commuter. You take the train into work. And you have two, and you remember, you have two cars. Your first car is, um, is a Volvo, extra armored. You know what I'm talking about, side airbag, front. It's like driving a tank. Your second car is some kind of a tin trap. Now, I don't want to insult any of your cars, but it's um, you know, Yugo. Are there even Yugos left? And you found a used Yugo. I don't know where you found it. So every day you drive to the train station, which is only five minutes away, but you're too lazy to walk. And your first day is your lucky day. You drive your Volvo into the train station. You park the car, you get out of the car, you get on the train, you go into work six o'clock in the morning. You work all day, you work all evening, you work all night. 10 o'clock, you make yourself, you get back on the train, you get back home. Now, how else can you afford the big car or a big house, the two car garage, the two cars and the two spouses? I don't know. So you get in your Volvo and um, you start to drive home. Remember, you live only five minutes away, but you get to the top of the hill and the light turns red. You say, oh, drat. I'm censoring as I'm going along. You'd probably use some stronger language. But as you're sitting there watching the light, illegal thoughts start to cross your mind. You say, what if I ran this red light? Think of the two things you worry about. You could get a ticket, right? But you're in the suburbs at 10 o'clock at night. The police have all gone home. You're not going to get a ticket. 
The second thing you worry about is getting hit by somebody. But then you remember you're in your Volvo. If somebody hits you, you get a little dent on the side. The other guy's all crumpled up, but that's his problem. You run the red light. You make it home safely. Next day, you repeat this process, but today is your unlucky day. You drive the Yugo to the train station. You park it, you go into work at 6. You work all day, you work all evening, you work all night. 10 o'clock at night, you drag yourself out of the train. You get into the car, you pull up to the top of the hill, the light turns red again. It's like a conspiracy. And as you sit there watching the red light, remembering what you did yesterday and get ready to hit the gas pedal, you remember you're not no longer in your Volvo. You're in your Yugo. You say, what am I thinking? If I go through this red light and a guy hit, and a guy on a bicycle hits me, I could roll off the road. So you stop. Think of why you stop for the red light. Because you were scared of getting hurt. Now, so here's the way to think about it. You're the manager of an all equity funded mature company. You're driving a Volvo. The red light is a bad project. You went right through the red light because you weren't afraid of getting hurt. Think of the same red light as a bad project, but now think of the company with a lot more debt. Think of it as that Volvo stripped of its airbags, made into a Yugo, and think of why you stop. You're afraid of getting hurt. I'm trying to make this personal. I know it's an extreme argument for debt, but it's an argument that was made by Michael Jensen. Remember Jensen from Jensen's Alpha? Mike likes to add, attach his name to everything he creates. This is called the Jensen free cash flow argument for debt. And he made it in the 1980s as a justification for leverage buyouts. And it wasn't an explanation that I bought into because in a leverage buyout, you aren't just borrowing money, you're borrowing way too much money. In fact, using the car analogy, it's like taking your Yugo into the car dealership and asking them to remove the air balloons. They're not quite airbags, they're tiny balloons. So take out the air balloons and put in air knives. You know what air knives are? You hit something, a knife comes right out of the steering wheel into your stomach. Would you ever drive that car? You'd walk to the station every day, right? When you do a leverage buyout, it's like putting an air knife in your car. Every downturn in the economy is going to be the knife coming out. But you can see, at least in a loose sense, what this argument is making. It's an argument for more discipline. So let's say we get this argument. Yeah? And I'm going to give you three groups of companies. You tell me, based on just the discipline argument, which of these three groups is the best candidate for borrowing money? So they all three have very little debt. That's what I mean by conservative finance. The first company is a privately owned company, and you're the owner. Think about it. Do you need debt to make your discipline taking projects? The second group is publicly traded companies where the stocks are held by millions of investors, none of whom has a large enough stake to care. There are no actors. The third group is publicly traded companies, but there's a Carl Icahn or a Bill Ackman with a chunk of stock making a lot of noise. Which of these three groups is the best candidate for debt as a discipline mechanism? I see a lot of Bs. Now, let's see why. Nathan, you said A. I'm going to put you on the spot. Why would you say Reddit, Reddit. I'm sorry, what? I'm ready. Go ahead. So. Yeah, as so I was thinking through it, the, uh, the publicly traded companies just have, it seems like, more kind of public insight or discipline forced by being public, and that a privately owned business could really operate in the Volvo sense, and I think most blind to discipline, uh, generally speaking. You've got to be careful though, you're, you're the private owner, you've got your entire wealth tied up in the company. If you need debt to keep you disciplined, you're in big, big, big trouble, right? I, th I can see where you're going from. You're right, private companies can sometimes get und undisciplined, but they get undisciplined in a different way. They get undisciplined with their equity. I mean, you. the reason is, if you borrow too much and you're a private owner, you have a lot more to lose than a manager at a publicly traded company being sloppy. So I can see I can see your rationale, but I think as a private owner, I would be more inclined to kind of misuse my equity than misuse my debt than misuse debt. Because if I go out and borrow money, I'm going to be in serious trouble. And that's going to essentially, you know, keep me from essentially even running my business. So I think public companies with a lot of splintered shareholders are the ones that Michael Jensen was focusing on. And those are the companies targeted in, the, in these leverage buyouts. Why would I not need it when I have a Carl Icahn on my board? Because he's going to make me borrow money. He's going to hold a gun to my head. He's going to say, why are you doing this? Think of what's happening at Occidental right now, right? 
It's it, 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 Carl Icahn is breathing down the neck of every manager at that company. So this discipline argument is a subtle one, but it's a benefit of debt nevertheless, but it's a much smaller benefit than the, than the, than the tax benefit of debt. So now let's talk about the cost of debt. We're in the midst of a crisis, so you're very, very, very cognizant of the cost of borrowing too much money. In fact, of you now I'm posting my sixth update on on the on the market this week, and I've been looking at different classifications of companies to see where the market damage has been greatest over the last six weeks. I tried PE, maybe high PE stocks are punished more. Found nothing. I looked at momentum, didn't mean it make a difference. I looked at dividends and buybacks, didn't make a difference. The only classification that explains differences in damage across companies in this crisis is how much debt you have. More indebted companies are being punished much more strongly than less indebted companies. A reminder of bankruptcy costs, but you shouldn't need that reminder, right? When you borrow money, if you think about it, there is an expected bankruptcy cost. And it comes from two, two, two variables. One is the probability that you will go bankrupt. And that probability will always increase as you borrow more money for everybody. How much it will increase though will depend on how stable your earnings are. If you have more stable earnings, the probability will increase less than if you have more unpredictable earnings. But then there's a second component, and this is a tricky one, which is a cost of bankruptcy. You see, what's a cost of bankruptcy? There are two costs. The first is what I call a direct cost. The direct cost arises once you go bankrupt. A study actually in the 1970s of railroads in the US because almost every single railroad in the US went bankrupt and what it found was that the the cost of legal costs and the bankruptcy costs involved with going bankrupt accounted for about 30 percent of the assets you know I was um, my son works at um, only one of my my kids works in finance and one and my son works at a, at an appraisal firm and about two years ago, I asked him what project he was working on. And he said he was working on the Lehman project. I said, what project? The Lehman project? He said, yeah, we're working out some of the, some of the costs, some of the issues in the Lehman project. Lehman went bankrupt in 2008. They were still working on it in 2018, and they were being paid for it. You know what the collective legal costs from the Lehman bankruptcy were? About $2 billion. That's a direct cost of bankruptcy. It's a deadweight cost. But there is a second cost to borrowing money and, and bankruptcy that I think is an even bigger cost. And I call this an indirect bankruptcy cost. It's a cost that arises because people perceive you're in trouble. You see, what are you talking about? Let's say that I open my newspaper and I read a story that you are a company, you're in trouble, you might not make it through next year and I'm a potential customer. Let's say you're a car company. Let's say I read a new story that your GM that you might not make it through next year. I'm not buying my next car from GM then. So customers start buying your product because they think you might go bankrupt. Your suppliers start doing demanding cash because they say, look, we're not settling for credit because they think you're going bankrupt. Your employees are checking out monster.com or job sites because they think you're going go bankrupt. You see what I'm saying? The perception that you might be in trouble might be enough to actually put you into a debt spiral. That's called the indirect bankruptcy cost. So that indirect bankruptcy cost is going to vary across companies. You think why would it be different for different companies? If there is a perception that Boeing will not make it through this crisis, and let's say you're Emirates and you want to order for whatever reason 10 new aircraft today. Are you ordering it from Boeing if you think they might not make it? I don't think so. For Boeing, the indirect bankruptcy cost is huge. It's something they should have thought about when they borrowed money in the good times, because if things turn bad, the perception you're in trouble can feed into even more trouble. In contrast, think about Kroger's, a grocery store. When I walk into a grocery store, I don't stop once I go through the door and ask, is this a AAA rated grocery store or a triple C rated grocery store? Frankly, I don't care. I'm here to buy lettuce. I'm not planning to bring it back five years from now. With a grocery store, the perception you're in trouble, having a low rating doesn't affect your revenue. So customers don't stop buying. Your suppliers usually need only three or five days of credit. They're still giving you the stuff. A grocery store is going to be less affected by being perceived to be in trouble than an aircraft manufacturer. So I've kind of answered 
the next question ahead of time. So when you look at a grocery store as an airplane manufacturer, you'd expect an airplane manufacturer to have much higher indirect bankruptcy costs in a grocery store. So what does that mean? You have a grocery store and an airplane manufacturer who have about the same operating income. You would expect the grocery store to borrow more money than the airplane manufacturer because they face less indirect bankruptcy costs. So I'm going to throw you the third company though. What do you think the indirect bankruptcy cost is for a tech company? And will it vary across different kinds of tech companies? You, let's, take, let's make it specific. Do you think the indirect bankruptcy cost is a big issue for Netflix? And if so, where would it show up? Do you think customers, a pair you want to try? Yeah, people would know it by the annual subscription, they'll buy the month to month subscription okay. and not. You know. But that effect is going to be, in fact, that might help Netflix, right? Month to month is higher than the annual. So the customer revenue, it. it might be become more, I'm sorry, what? But then there will be a higher drop rate, right? There might be a higher drop rate. So that's a good point. So maybe there'll be a higher drop rate. So the re but I think the revenue effect is going to be smaller than, I think Nico brings up the point of, you know, of vendors and producers and Olivia brings up the point of content. They're, a big part of their business model is to keep churning out new content, right? Now, whether it's docu-series, whether it's new movies, that new content requires that they be able to access fresh capital. And guess what? If they're perceived to be in trouble, that that gravy train might might shift out. So I think across tech companies, it will depend on the tech companies. Some tech companies, the indirect bankruptcy costs are going to be low because of the kinds of models they run. And for some tech companies, it's going to be higher. But for tech companies, the bigger issue is the uncertainty about future earnings. Even the most successful tech companies know that they're living on borrowed time. So their expected bankruptcy costs might be high, not so much because the indirect bankruptcy costs is high, because the, but because the probability of bankruptcy is higher for any given level of earnings. So think about whatever company you've picked and start thinking through those two issues, because that's going to give you at least some insight into what kind of debt you should expect to have. In fact, staying on that point of bankruptcy costs, you can already see why utilities can have high debt ratios. What is it about utilities that allows them to have high debt ratios? Think about the, the bankruptcy costs and tell me what it is about utilities that keep bankruptcy costs low. One is very stable cash flows because they're regulated monopolies and their revenues are pretty predictable. You're still using power even though there's a shutdown, there's a quarantine. And the second is the indirect bankruptcy cost there because these are kept are relatively small. It's not like customers say, well, you know what, you know, this is actually happening in Northern California where Pacific Gas and Electric is in serious trouble, but their revenues haven't been affected much because people still need power. So you'd expect utilities to have high debt ratios. So that bankruptcy cost argument is a very good one to look across sectors. And I'll send you a list of debt ratios by sectors and see why some sectors borrow less money than others. Let's talk about agency costs. As I said, agency costs arise anytime you ask somebody else to do something for you. So let's say you meet as a group. Very tough to do in today's day and age where everything is virtual. But let's say we're back at Stern, it's in the fall. You have a group of five, you meet for a project. I don't teach in the fall, so it can't be my project. It's somebody else's project. It's late at night, you decide to send one person out for sandwiches. And the person takes orders and you're very specific. You say, look, I want turkey on wheat, lots of mustard, no mayo. The person leaves. They get to the sandwich shop. They forgot to write down what you asked for. They get to the front of the line and say, what did he want? Turkey, oh, turkey on white with lots of mayo, no mustard. No, he's so casual about that sandwich. He's not eating it. You are. That's an agency cost. But I'll give you my favorite example of an agency cost. Now, many of you are too young to have kids, but if you have kids and you hire a babysitter, classic agency cost problem. Because you get to leave at seven o'clock, you tell the babysitter, you give very specific instructions, make sure the kids, kids get to bed by nine and don't feed them sugar after eight. Okay? So it gets to be eight o'clock and the kids, of course, sense weakness. They go to the babysitter and they say, you know what, we want ice cream. And this babysitter said, no, your parents said no ice cream. No. No, but 
they keep bugging you and you, keep, you want to keep watching the show you're watching on TV. So finally, you know what? You say, look, take the sugar bowl and the ice cream up, eat whatever you want. 10 o'clock, you get back from dinner. And what do you see? Total chaos. Your kids are bouncing off the walls. The babysitter is in a hurry to leave. You don't know why. But you realize very quickly why when you open up the freezer and you realize there's no ice cream left. It's a classic agency cost problem. See so you now how we factored in? One, you stop going out. That's one way. The second is you assume that if you go out, you lose two nights of sleep because your kids are going to bounce off the walls. You build in the cost. So essentially, with agency costs, you either build in the cost or you stop doing it. Same thing applies with debt and equity. Think about the agency costs here. Okay? Let's play the role of an equity investor borrowing money. And we played this game earlier, let's play it again. When you borrow money, what do you tell the banker? I'm going to take really safe projects, I'm, take, I'm going to take really good care of your money. The banker trusts you, gives you the money. After you get the money, your incentives are very different. You want to take the riskiest project you can. Why? Because you get the upside and the bank bears the downside. In fact, you might take all the money and put it in number five on the, on the racetracks. Because when you get all the upside, equity investors left to their own devices will take riskier projects than you want them to. They'll pay themselves more dividends than you want to. So as a bank, what do you do? When you lend money, you put in covenants. When I talk about debt, I say, look, if you're a company that values freedom and flexibility, don't borrow money because when you borrow money, you're going to find your freedoms restricted. You're going to find yourself in a straitjacket and the straitjacket is going to get tighter and tighter the more money you borrow. So other things remaining equal, the more freedom and flexibility you need as a company. You're in a sector where you have to have freedom to act quickly. Don't borrow money. It's one reason why I think the big tech companies the Googles, the Facebooks, even the Apples of the world don't borrow as much as they potentially could because they value that freedom to be able to act quickly. And it's a valuable thing to have. So when we talk about agency cost, that's the agency cost issue. And we've already kind of talked about utilities from the context of bankruptcy costs. But think about what might drive the agency cost. And you're already going to see the drivers of agency costs come from what kind of company are. So I'm going to give you three companies and I want you to think like a lender. Remember, agency cost arises because you worry about what people do with your money. So the three companies that are lining up to borrow money from you, in which of those three, three are you going to be least worried about what they're going to do with your money? And which of these three are you going to be most worried? The first company is a technology company. The second company is a large regulated utility. And the third is a real estate company. In which of these three companies are you least worried about what you're going to do with your debt? What the utility, and not only because they have stable earnings. You know what else utilities have? They're restricted from going. A utility can't go out and acquire a consumer product company or a tech company. It's restricted in its business model. So because it's restricted, you know they can't play games with you. So regulated utility is the one you're going to be, and that again explains why utilities can borrow so much money. Real estate companies, maybe we should be more worried, but you know what makes lenders feel less worried when they lend to a real estate developer? What, do, what does a real estate developer do with the money? They build a building. It's physical. And for whatever reason, people seem to like to lend on physical assets. And if you can cover the physical assets with gold, I think it's even better. And they say, oh, feel good. I look, I look what my... Whereas when you lend to a tech company, what do they use your debt for? R&D. And you have no idea what they're doing, right? For all you know, they might be hiring guys off the street, putting white coats on them and say, walk around, look busy, act like you're doing something. You have no idea. So guess what? The agency costs are much higher when you're a company in intangible assets. It could be a tech company, it could be a pharmaceutical company, it could be Theranos, which is a non-company. But essentially, the more intangible your assets are, the less debt you should have. Which brings me to my last and final cost, which is when you borrow money today, you're giving up the capacity to borrow that money in the future. That's stating the obvious, but it's always nice to hold back on debt capacity. Why? Because bad things can happen. Crises can happen. Other things remaining equal, the more uncertain you are about the future, the less you should borrow money. So I'll make a prediction. After this crisis, at least for a few years, three, four, five years, companies are going to borrow less. You know why? Because a crisis reminds you that bad things can happen. 
But I'm a realist. I've seen what happens after about four or five years. They forget. From 2009 to 2013, U.S. companies became much more cautious about debt. By 2014, they'd forgotten. By 2019, they were off to the races again. So there's memory, but the memory is not long term. So I'm going to leave you with a final, final point, which is this is from a survey of, of companies where people, where companies were asked, you know, CFOs were asked, if you were given a choice as to where you would raise money, what is your best or last, uh, what are your best and your least and your least favorite choices? So before I do that, I'll show you what CFOs value. So this survey looked at what they value. They value flexibility the most. And they claim, at least, that being close to the peer group was the thing that they value the least. I don't believe them for a moment when they say that, but this is what they claim. So they value flexibility and survival more than everything else. So I want you to keep that in mind and think about the different ways you can raise money. And I'll list them up. You can raise money from retained earnings. You can raise money from new equity issues. You can raise money from new debt. You can raise money from preferred stock. Or you can raise money from convertible, preferred convertible debt. So basically, you can raise money from retained earnings, new equity, new debt, or some hybrid. If you had your choice as a company, where would you like to raise money for product? Think like a manager. Where would you like to raise money for your projects? What, what source of financing would you most like to use? Nico said retained earnings. What's so great about retained earnings? Why is retained? I agree with you entirely. Managers left to their own devices want to find everything. With What's so great about retained earnings? You don't have to answer to anybody. There are no restrictions. You already have it, right? Every other funding source, you've got to jump through hoops. So what's going to be your next? So retain earnings is number one. What's going to be your next best option? Think like a manager, not like an equity investor. I hear a lot of new equity. You're thinking too reasonably. With new equity, though, Remember, you got to issue a prospectus, you got to have financial disclosure to the market, you got to go to the market, you got dilution, you got all these things to explain. You know what the next best choice was? They actually prefer new debt as opposed to new equity. And next session, we're going to start with that financing hierarchy because it's a very interesting way of thinking about why do companies pick what they do. So next session, I'll review the trade-off and I'll give you a chance to ask more questions that might come up. But I want you to take your company. You know what I mean by your company? It's my weekly nag of, have you thought about your company for your project? I'm actually going to take that Google shared spreadsheet and ask you to enter the numbers you're getting for your company just to prod you to make sure you're kind of keeping up with it. But I'd like you to take your company and take, you, take it through the trade-off of, hey, what does my company look like in terms of the benefits and the costs? And how much debt would I expect it to have and then next session, when we start out, we'll start with this financing hierarchy that comes from surveys and use it to explain why some companies, why companies like using return earnings and why they might prefer debt over equity in their choices, because that shows up in practice. Straight debt is a much more common way of raising new financing than equity. We'll talk about why. But that's the that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining me. Are there any final questions before I let you guys go? Just very quickly, yeah. if you don't have cash on your balance sheet, how can you use your retained earnings? Yeah, that's a good funds? point. I you know, reti not retain earnings from the past. I'm talking about return earnings out of net income. So this year's income. So think about this year's ongoing income. I'm talking about the retained earnings there. So you're right. The retained earnings from the past years is not a source of funding. It's how you funded past projects. Now you have new projects. You have new net income. You want to keep a portion of the net income. Right, but you're good. That's a good point, Perry. My thought is like, what are we solving for here? Ideally, I agree with you that we should be solved for the company, but most in most cases, aren't we solving for the current shareholders and like maximizing their income? And that's the purpose. Yeah, but but practically, are you really solving even for them? You're actually solving for the managers who make this decision, right? Because current shareholders are not in the ta in the room when the CFO decides what funding to use. So here we're just looking at from the manager's perspective, what's right. And whether it's right for your current shareholders and equity investors, we'll have to come back and ask. I think companies often do very dysfunctional things. 
because it serves the managerial interest. So when I put, post the financing hierarchy, that's not the hierarchy I would want as an equity investor in the company, but that's the hierarchy the managers will pick. That's good. Thank yeah. you. All right, Professor. Yes. Can I ask one? Uh, so uh, you, you said like sometimes cost of debt looks cheaper, but uh, it adds a lot of... Like, no, the cost of debt is always lower if you think in percent. Take a look at your own cost of capital, right? The cost of debt for yeah. Disney was like three and a half percent. The cost of equity was nine percent. So it is lower. But you were saying it's compensated by you know, increase in cost of equity. Exactly. Uh, are there chances, almost like arbitrage opportunities, where the cost of debt uh, is it has to be that you're getting debt at a subsidized rate. So lenders are lending to you at three percent when they should be charging six percent given your default risk. Okay. Then you could get that. But there's got to be, you know, there's got to be some structural problem at the market that's allowing you to do that. But that can happen. In fact, if you have subsidized loans, somebody asks about bailouts. One of the problems with bailouts for large companies, you're changing future corporate practice by doing this. Because what are you doing? You're saying if you get into trouble, your bankruptcy costs, we will bet. Taxpayers will bet. That's not good. It's going to make companies borrow more money. And that's one of the things I always worry about when I see big bailouts is what is it doing for future corporate behavior? And that's something, again, we'll start next the next session with. So in, in, in the zero tax world, when you were saying that uh, there is no uh, cost benefit of taking more debt, if there is zero tax. If there's no tax benefit, you should never borrow money. I'll be quite honest. There's no real reason for borrowing money because you create all the costs. You've got bankruptcy costs. You get none of the benefits. But people continue to do it, which means the illusion must run deep that debt is cheaper than equity. And I think it does. Okay. Yes, Rukhra. Yeah, a very quick one. Isn't there, maybe I'm sort of thinking too deeply around the machinations of the equation, but if you take on debt um, and it is, it costs, the cost of debt is lower, and then that filters into your kind of cost of equity, your cost of capital, that would really only affect product going forward, right? You, you still artificially change the No, you don't. No, you don't. Remember, you got to level the beta, right? Because your beta doesn't stay fixed. So if you take your company and double the debt, your cost of equity doesn't stay fixed, right? You got to unlever and relever the beta. And you know, once you unlever and relever the beta, your cost of capital. But doesn't that only really affect... It affects, ev it affects everything because when you borrow money, you're refinancing all of your existing assets, right? It's, okay. it's not just new projects. Everything really changes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's let's end for the day, and thank you for joining me. And I will see you next Monday. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.